pre pre presentation applause is always good. I appreciate that. Uh, so I'm Brad Clay, orthopedic sports medicine surgeon uh, and assistant professor at the University of South Alabama Department of Orthopedics. Today we're going to talk about injuries in baseball, uh, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. So throwing, it truly is an art. It's a coordination of movements uh, where we develop power in our core and transfer that to our upper extremity to develop velocity uh, during the pitch, as you see in this athlete here. There's multiple phases in the throwing, uh, art of throwing. The, the substantial amount of power we generate uh, can lead to injuries. Um, some of you might, may be familiar with some of these terms. The goal of today's talk is to, to get you a little more familiar with these terms and how we treat and prevent these. Substantial amount of power de uh, developed during the baseball pitch. Uh, anywhere between 60 and 100 newton meters of torque in the elbow and in the shoulder. Um, and additionally, three, over 300 newtons of anterior force at the shoulder joint. Uh, what, what does all that mean? If you were to hold two Snickers in your hand, that's about one newton of force. So an extreme amount of force placed on the shoulder. If you hold your arm up right now, you got about 90 degrees of rotation in your shoulder. And during the baseball pitch, as you see here, you can get 165 degrees of rotation. So just extreme amount of torque uh, placed on, on the shoulder and elbow during the pitching. So just how fast is, is about 7,000 degrees per second? Well, it's the fastest measured human joint motion in the body. And if your arm can maintain this speed just for one second, you, your arm would do 20 full revolutions. So just an extreme amount of, of power and velocity placed on the shoulder and elbow. And what do we do about this to, to, to accommodate that extreme amount of power in the shoulder and elbow? Well, we, our bodies undergo changes. So when we're growing, when our growth plates are open, when we're young, we have a bony adaptation. So we have changes in the bone as we develop. Um, and then we have additional changes in the shoulder as well. So we'll get some tearing or some changes in the superior labrum where the biceps comes in and inserts at the top of the glenoid. All of this so that we get increased external rotation, which is pulling back of the arm um, and leads to decreased internal rotation, as you see here. So as we develop and, and throw, um, as we grow, we get increase in external rotation or pulling back, decrease in internal rotation. Now, is this adapt adaptation, is it advantage advantageous or is it pathologic? Well, it's a little bit of both. So it's, it's advantageous until it becomes pathologic. It's trying to find that, that happy medium uh, for the pitcher. And that's what's referred to as a thrower's paradox. So you want that perfect balance of mobility. You want lax enough so that you can get back to the slot, as the pitchers call it, so you can generate the velocity. But you want to be stable enough to prevent excess translation and, and, and increase risk of injury. So external rotation has been studied. If you have too much external rotation, you're at risk of injury. If you don't have enough external rotation, you're at risk of injury. And more important to the athlete, if you don't have enough external rotation, you're not gonna develop that velocity. Your velocity comes from external rotation. Similarly, internal ro rotation. So all throwers, as we've talked about, they're gonna have more external rotation, less internal rotation in the shoulder. But this can become problematic um, when you lose internal rotation more than you gain your external rotation, that's what we uh, refer to as GERD or glenohumeral rotation deficit. And this becomes a problem when we lose about set 25 degrees compared to the contralateral side. That's when we, we we're set up for injury. So what is this GERD? What is this that everybody talks about? So it's due to repetitive overhead throwing. It's in that late cocking phase, so right here in the slot where the pitcher gets all the way back. And what happens is everything in the back of the shoulder gets tight, everything in the front of the shoulder gets loose, and that sets, us, sets the pitcher up for injury. Multiple different types of injuries. So tight back, loose front, you can get some instability, so too much movement in the shoulder, which can lead to injury. You can get some impingement, which can lead to tears of the labrum or tears of the, of the rotator cuff and then the slap tear that I'm sure most of you have heard about. It's been shown that throwers with GERD or with the tight back capsule, loose front capsule, they're 25% more likely to, to sustain a slap tear. So what is a slap tear? 
So it was first described by Dr. Andrews in 1985 in about 73 overhead athlete, athletes, and then it was later classified and coined slap tear. So a slap tear is a superior labrum tear from anterior to posterior. So at the very top of the labrum where the biceps comes in from front to back, that's a slap tear. So this is a normal shoulder scope intraoperatively. This is the humeral head. This is the glenoid here. Sorry, I don't have a pointer so I can't uh, show you guys exactly, but this is the humeral head. This is the glenoid or, or the cup that the ball sits in. And then, can you see this? Here. So, let me see, I'll just walk over there since we don't have a pointer. So this is the humeral head. This is the glenoid or the cup, and this is the labrum. So the labrum is a bumper that goes all the way around the cup and provides some extra stability in the shoulder. And then this is the biceps coming in. So the biceps comes in and inserts at the very top of the labrum, and that's the slap region. So the superior labrum where the biceps comes in. And so a slap tear is when you have kind of peeling back of that, that biceps. So the biceps comes in here, a lot of tension on this area, and it ends up tearing and peeling back the labrum here. And that, that's what, how you end up with the slap tear. You, use, you lose the confluence of the, of the superior labrum where the biceps insert, inserts, as you see there, leading to a slap tear. By itself. Not typically. Yeah, we'll go over that. So there's, we'll go over non-operative treatment with the slap tear, and especially in the overhead athletes, because there's continued tension on that area from throwing. So typically, no, it will not heal. Sometimes we can decrease the inflammation associated it, uh, with it and improve your symptoms, but it usually will not heal on itself. So how do you get that slap tear? So repetitive overhead activity, that's what leads to a slap tear. Um, and there's two different philosophies of how slap tears uh, occur. One of them being the forced contraction of the biceps during follow through, pulling and tugging on that, that superior labrum where the biceps inserts. This is a video from where I did my fellowship at ASMI Andrews in Birmingham. And what we're doing is contracting the biceps and you can see it pulling on the top of that, that uh, labrum there where the biceps comes down and inserts. So contraction of the biceps and you see that pull at the very top there. So that repetitive kind of contract, eccentric contraction of the biceps leads to tearing at the very top. That's one etiology. Another is kind of a peelback mechanism. So uh, the biceps inserts at the very top here, as we talked about, and then during that late cocking phase or pulling back, the vector shifts posteriorly and twists on itself and it eventually peels back at the top of the labrum there, leading to tearing. So those are kind of the two uh, philosophies of how we, how we get slap tears. How do these athletes present? So kind of vague, deep-seated shoulder pain with overhead activity. Some of them have superior pain that goes to the back. Some of them have anterior pain and, and occasional mechanic, mechanical symptoms like clicking or popping. What they'll, show, what they'll tell you and what you'll notice is their per performance goes down. They lose velocity, they lose strength, they lose accuracy. They'll talk about a sense of their arm giving out or they have a dead arm. And many of them recall a specific event where they're throwing and they they have this episode. How do we evaluate these athletes? So it's a, like everything in medicine, it's a combination. There's no one specific test or, or imaging or MRI CT that gives us the diagnosis. You gotta treat the whole patient as a whole, put the story together and figure it out. Um, there's multiple physical exam maneuvers we do. Uh, here's one O'Brien test, crank test. All, all these do is put the, that superior labrum where the biceps comes in on a stretch and try to recreate that, that tearing mechanism and, and reproduce their pain. Imaging wise, uh, MR arthrogram, what that is, it's an MRI after we inject some dye into the joint. And that's what you see uh, here. So everything in the black is the bone. Got the humeral head here, the cup here, the glenoid, everything white is the joint uh, in, after we inject a dye in it rotator cuff coming in, inserting at the top. And what you look for is the arrow right here where you see dye going up into the superior part of the labrum and, and transecting it. And that that's leads to a, a slap tear diagnosis if it's consistent with the, 
with the physical exam and the history as well. So how do we treat these? Um, first line in most athletes, in season, off season, whatever it is, is rest them, non-op treatment. So modify their activities, anti-inflammatories, ice, stretching. You could consider an injection. And then the mainstay of, of treatment, both operative and non-operative, is physical therapy. So work on their mechanics. If they have any of that decreased motion, work on those motion deficits. Uh, work on the, the body as a whole, the core, the shoulder, the elbow, everything. And then specific stretches to try to loosen that tight back part of the capsule um, to allow that, that improvement in motion. And there's different stretches. So this one at the top called the sleeper stretch, putting that capsule on, on tension to allow it to stretch out. Cross arm adduction uh, stretch. If you've ever watched baseball, you see all the pitchers doing this. And that's what they're doing. They're trying to keep that tight posterior capsule loose. Yes, ma'am. Steroid yes, ma'am. And I'm wondering if you're going to go into any side effects of that. I've heard rumors lately about some things that happen from the extended use. Yeah, I wasn't, but we can go into that. Okay. Um, there's a lot of recent information coming out that there may be some negative side effects of corticosteroid injections. Mm -hmm. There might be some systemically when you take them, you know, take pills, but usually localized injection into a single joint one or two, three times is not going to lead to, to systemic long-term effects. All right, so, um, and then we get these athletes to return back to sports. So we get them into a throwing program, gradually increasing the stress on the, the arm, and then release them back. Unfortunately, with non-operative treatment, about 50% return to sports, so not very good. What has been shown as beneficial is if you have that thrower that has that tight posterior capsule or that GERD is what we call it, that they, we can improve those with non-operative with non, uh, treatment with the stretching. Um, and it's important to get, that, get it early. Early improvement of shoulder much, motion is important to uh, obtain satisfactory results. What if we, uh, ha you know, we fail non-operatively and transition to surgery would be our next option. This is just some pictures from, from a surgery. So what we do is we use an instrument to roughen up the bone here so we get good bleeding bone. And then we put sutures and an anchor in the bone to, re to repair that slap tear back down to the bone where it should be. Uh, and how do we do surgically? Not very good non-operatively. Well, not very good operatively either. So this is a study published last year by Dr. Andrews looked over 200 baseball athletes and how they returned to play. So only 62% successfully returned to play. Um, worse for pitchers, they put a lot more stress on their shoulder as compared to non-pitching athletes. 59% for pitchers, 76% for non-pitchers. Um, those are not good results. Most of the stuff we do in orthopedics is 90% return to play. Um, so we're just not there yet with, with baseball. And then how, how did these athletes feel uh, compared to pre-injury? So, 43%. If I told you that the surgery we were going to do for you, you would be 43% of you would be better. Half of this room probably wouldn't elect to undergo it. Um, why, why are we not that good with this yet? Well, as we talked about, you know, that increased external rotation is an adaptation that the athlete develops over their entire life. It allows them to get back into the slot and generate that velocity. Well, when you repair these, they'll lose some of that external rotation we kind of tighten this area down, and it's been shown that the loss of external rotation is, is the kiss of death for the athletes. So that's probably one reason that the athletes don't return as well with, with operative treatment. So what do we do? Well, prevention is the best treatment for these injuries. You gotta prevent these injuries, and we do that working, working as a team with the athletic trainers, physical therapists, uh, work, you know, finding these athletes and, and, and improving their motion with the different type of stretches we talked about, the sleeper stretch, cross arm adduction stretch, uh, door wall stretch. They should be stretching before the game, after the game, before practice, after practice, every day. And if you look at, watch major league, major league athletes, you'll see them doing this. So that's shoulder. Moving on to elbow. So Tommy John, every, probably everybody in this room has heard Tommy John. So what is Tommy John? So Tommy John was an athlete in the 70s, pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers that uh, sustained an injury and underwent treatment by Dr. Job in California. 
Um, and what we're talking about with the Tommy John ligament or Tommy John reconstruction is the UCL, so the ulnar collateral ligament or the Tommy John's ligament. This is a ligament on the inside of the elbow right here, and there's three main bundles, the, the, the main bundle being this anterior bundle, um, which is the primary resistant to valgus stress or, or the turning out of the elbow when you turn. So that ligament gets stressed about 30 to 120 degrees, so right in that throwing motion. Um, and repetitive, that repetitive stress during that late cocking puts tension on that ligament and can lead to tears. So why is this important? Why does it matter? Uh, this is some data from where I did my fellowship at Andrews uh, in, in Birmingham. So if you look in the 90s, mid-90s, compared to last year, 19, uh, in 2019, there's been a six-fold increase in the amount of surgeries done at Andrews Sports Medicine in, over, the, over the past 15 you know, to 20 years. And, and even more importantly, if you look on who these athletes are, it's our youth athletes. So our, our young kids and our high school players are getting these injuries and being operated on. So there's something, we, we gotta do something to, about it to stop it. So what are risk factors for your Tommy John's ligament? Same thing for, for shoulder. So if we could stop one thing, it's having these athletes pitching while they're fatigued. Um, if you notice your pitcher or you know a, a sibling, a, a grandson, a granddaughter, whoever that's pitching, and they're, they're losing velocity, they're losing uh, accuracy, they're, they look tired, their body looks tired, it's probably because they are, and their mechanics are gonna be altered and they're gonna be at increased risk of injury. So take those athletes out. Uh, sport specialization is also a huge one. So only playing one sport. So playing baseball, not playing any other sports are shown to increase your risk of injury. Year-round play, so everybody talks about year-round play. You know, my son plays 12 months a year, he's gonna be the next Nolan Ryan. Um, that's gonna increase the risk of injury. And then other things as well. So throwing harder, being bigger, being older, and your position played. So pitchers and catchers are at increased risk of injury to their elbows as well. Not only their elbows, their shoulders. So how do these athletes present? So they'll have pain on the inside of their elbow during that late cocking or early acceleration phase. Some of them kind of have insidious onset of pain while, while others will have an acute pop or an acute injury where they feel their arm go out. And then same thing, they'll notice decreased velocity, de decreased, decreased accuracy. And some of them will have that ulnar nerve symptoms as well. So they'll get missing tingling on the inside too, two fingers here as well. How do we evaluate these athletes? Physical exam will palpate the two bony prominences where the, the ligament originates and where it inserts at as well as the entire course of the ligament. We'll test their range of motion. And then we have all these special tests we do to try to uh, recreate that valgus stress or that cocking back, which puts stress on the ligament uh, and, and reproduces their pain. X-rays are the first thing we do. So we'll get kind of plain films looking at the elbow. We'll, we'll get these to see if they have any kind of calcification in the ligament or, or, injury, or evidence of old injuries. Um, and then historically we did stress tests. So this is a normal uh, AP view of the elbow. And then you put a valgus stress or trying to cock that, that elbow back. And if you see it uh, gap open here for uh, more than about three millimeters compared to this, then that can be indicative that they have an incompetent ligament or a ligament tear. MRI or MR arthrogram. So injecting the elbow with, with dye uh, and, and then getting an MRI is kind of the mainstay of evaluating for these injuries now. This is a normal MRI. So this is the ligament here. So this black structure originating from the bone here, coming all the way down and being nice and confluent on its insertion here. So that's what a normal ligament looks like. And we can compare this to a, to a tear. So this would be a full thickness tear, so completely torn ligament. You see that black arrow coming down and then here, comes down completely torn and gone, and then comes back. And if, you in, if, if it's an arthrogram where you inject this elbow joint, you'll see the dye come out here and it'll be all in the soft tissues, indicating that they have a full thickness tear. In contrast, we also have uh, partial thickness tears too. So this, this would be an example of a partial thickness tear. So here, the ligament coming down, nice confluent to the bone here, 
And if you look at it here, the ligament's kind of lifted off and you see that die escaping down here and it looks like a T. We call it a T sign because it looks like a T that's sitting on its side. So that's what a partial tear would look like. So how do we treat these? We can try non-operative therapy, um, rest, physical therapy, brace to prevent that gapping open of the elbow. Historically, very poor results, 42% return to sports. Um, there's some new things out there that are kind of experimental or investigational, uh, PRP or plate, platelet-rich plasma. What they do is you, they take your blood, spin your blood down, take out the red blood cells, which is down here, get this part of the platelets that, are, that have all your growth factors in your blood, take that out and inject it. Um, for partial thickness tears, there's some studies that show that there's some pretty good results, 73% return, return to play uh, with good to excellent results in, in athletes. Um, and then stem cells as well, yeah. Yeah, so you inject it right into that ligament. So, so the people that are doing this will take, they, they, not for full thickness tears, but for partial tears like this, they'll put, put a, the PRP right there. Mm -hmm. And to get this to heal back down to the bone there. And there's some pretty good results out there with that from some studies. Kind of more experimental stuff. So stem cells, it's all out in the news. I'm sure you've heard about it. Um, there's some thought about trying this for, for UCL tears, but there's no studies out there yet. There's no research on it, so it's experimental and more, more studies are need, needed for that. So the gold standard of treatment is a UCL reconstruction. So actually reconstructing that ligament um, by taking a tendon either from the wrist or from the leg and using that to reconstruct your UCL. So your UCL is deficient. You take a, another tendon, drill some bone tunnels, and then use a new tendon to weave it and make you, make you a new ligament. First described in the 70s, excellent results, 90% return to play um, at an average of 12 to 18 months, um, just gold standard. There's multiple techniques to do it. Um, if you have a full thickness tear, this is what you're getting. This is what you're hearing the athletes, the major league players undergoing Tommy John surgery, this is what they're getting. I did want to bring up this. There's, there's a new alternative treatment that's, that's come, come about and has some good promising results, so a UCL repair. So why, why even consider something else if a reconstruction has been so successful? Uh, well, there's some limitations to, to the UCL reconstruction. Uh, one, return to plays a year, uh, even 18 months, so a year to 18 months. So they're gonna, your athlete's going to miss a season um, at least. And even more importantly to that, there's a wide spectrum of injury to the UCL. So there's low grade partial thickness tears that we talked about. There's avulsion injuries where you, where you have a great ligament and then you, you tear the ligament off the bone on either ends. And then there's the full thickness ligament tears. And then the quality of the ligament can, can differ too. So you can have a completely normal ligament and tear it, uh, or you can have kind of chronic beat up attritional ligament. Uh, with deficient tissue. So there's a wide variety of uh, injuries to the, to the UCL or the Tommy John's ligament. Therefore, they're, what's that? I was say, they haven't been able to come up with a lot of fissure ligaments. Not yet, not yet. Well, this is, I'll show you, it's kind of like that. Right. Um, so therefore, there, there may be a subset of these injuries that we can treat without undergoing the full reconstruction. And that's where the UCL repair has come along. Um, indications for it, so you fail conservative treatment, and you have a young overhead athlete that either has an acute avulsion injury or one of those partial thickness tears. The main thing with these, with these repairs is they must have good quality ligament tissue. Um, and you really determine that intraoperatively. You can't really tell that based on exam, based on MRI. You, you, you look at that intraoperatively. So if, if I have an athlete that's undergoing this, uh, we can send them for both. So reconstruction versus repair and we determine that intraoperatively based on the quality of their ligament. If they have a great ligament, then we can repair it. Uh, but if they have a, a, a attritional tear or poor quality of the ligament, or they have kind of bone in the ligament that we have to take out, and then their ligament's deficient, they're not a, they're not a candidate for this surgery. And a, appropriate patient selection is criti critical for a good outcome. This is what the repair looks like. 
So as compared to the reconstruction, you see here, the repair you put, you put two anchors in. So you put an anchor in here, which is made out of some plastic, and attached to that anchor has a, suit, a really strong suture, and you use that to suture the ligament down to the anchor. And then this is what you were talking about. So then there's this really strong suture tape, um, which is just a real strong suture material that you place on the back of it. And that kind of acts as a backstop to allow that ligament to heal, take the tension off the ligament while it heals. Um, and so this is, this is a, newer, a newer thing we're doing. We've been doing it for about five years. We'll talk about the results of that. This is just interesting. This is from Fellowship. Uh, Dr. Dugas, so this is one of his patients. So you can see here that partial thickness tear where the ligaments kind of pulled off the bone here. This is pre-op, and then he had an MRI done post-op just for, for something unrelated, and you can see it healed down nicely to the bone here again. It looks like a normal MRI. You see your bone tunnels here from where we put the, put the uh, anchors in. So how are we doing with this UCL repair stuff? Um, biomechanically, we did all that testing before we started using it. It's showing similar strength to the reconstruction. Um, how are we doing getting these athletes back? So 92% return to play at the same level or higher, so these athletes are getting back to playing. And, and the, the cool thing about this surgery is they're getting back at 6.7 months. So they're getting back at an average of seven months as compared to 12 to 18 months with the reconstruction. Um, how are their outcome scores doing? 88 at one year, 91 at two years. What does all that mean? So an asymptomatic healthy pitcher is gonna average about low to mid 90s. So these, these athletes outcomes at one and two years are, are good. However, like I said, it's a, new, it's a newer surgery. It's only been around about five years. And so we don't really know the long-term outcomes of, of this procedure. So more studies are indicated to, to look at longer, to, longer term outcomes, look at the long-term effects of this procedure, and then see, if, see what limitations we have to it. So that's a little bit about the surgery. So this is what we're trying to prevent. I was watching uh, the College World Series last year and this little snippet came across the screen and it says uh, this guy in the 60s pitched at Michigan. He threw two complete games in one day, 19 innings pitched, three, over 300 pitches in one day. So this is the guy that gets this shoulder injuries we talked about, the elbow injuries we just talked about. This is what we're trying to prevent. What can we do to prevent this? So avoid throwing while fatigued. I know I've said that before. If you understand one thing from this lecture, that's what I want to drill home. If your athlete is looking tired, take them out. If they're losing velocity, if they're losing control, take them out. They're, they're, they're setting up for an injury. Um, and then there's other, multiple other things we can we manage too. So monitoring their pitch counts, requiring days of rest, avoiding year-round play so that your athletes should have four months off per year with at least two to three of those consecutive. And then working on pro proper pitching mechanics, appropriate core, shoulder strength, and flexibility as well. I want to mention this website. Um, if you take something from this to pitchsmart.org, it's probably the... Uh, one of the best bits of information out there on, on pitching and, and how to prevent injuries. Um, it's it, it's an organization run by Major League Baseball and USA Baseball, um, and they, they put out all these guidelines for, for, for your athletes to prevent these injuries. I pulled this just off the website just to show you an example. So they have everything broken down by age, how many daily pitches they can throw in a game, and then based on the amount of pitches they throw, how many days rest are required after throwing, throwing those many pitches. And then they break it down even further based on age too. So I'm not gonna read all this. I know it's a, a big slide, but I just wanted to show you uh, an example from that. So ages 13 or 14, I chose that because one of the most common questions I get is when, when can my son throw a breaking ball? When can, he, when can he start throwing sliders? So according to their recommendations around age 13 to 14, after they developed a, a consistent fastball and change up. And then it has a lot of other things um, based off, based off your, your patient's age as well. So final thoughts, prevention is key. Work on proper mechanics, core strengthening, stretching. It really is a team effort. Everybody should be involved. So the player, parents, coach, 
athletic trainer, physical therapist, physician assistant, um, orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine, nurse, everybody's involved. It's a team effort. We got to look out for these athletes. Monitor for signs of fatigue. If you see it, take them out. And uh, the whole p play through pain mantra is you shouldn't do that. Not with the baseball athlete. If they start complaining of elbow, shoulder pain, have them come in and be seen and evaluated. All right, that's it. <laughs> Questions? Aside from Glenn, yes. Yes, ma'am. Do they always recover from it, from the ulnar nerve surgeries? It's hard to know based on not knowing the full details of what type of surgery he had. Um, it, I imagine he had an ulnar nerve transposition or something. He had the numbness and tingling I was talking about on the inside part. Um, and what, that, what that's caused, the reason they get that is they get it, the ulnar nerve here entrapped between those two bones we were talking about. And that can lead to some, some symptoms, some some paresthesias or numbness and tingling in the, in the fingers. If that's what he had and you released it and transpose it, that, those, that return to play in that population is extremely high, high 90s. So yes, I would, I would tell him yes. If that's a, that is if his ligament is good. He has a good ligament, a good ulnar collateral ligament. Yes, sir. Um, if there is damage to mm -hmm. the rotator, Mm -hmm. and physical therapy, what would be the likely cause of having to repeat physical therapy after six to nine months? So let me make sure I understand your question correct. So you're saying you, you had a rotator cuff tear, you, you were treated with physical therapy for six to nine months and... No. and no. Physical therapy for a shorter period. Shorter period of time. After six to nine months, had to repeat Yeah, it depends on what type of tear you had. The, t the types of tears we talked about today are partial, partial tears in the throwing athlete, kind of more chronic attritional tears that are full thickness. If, you, if you've tried physical therapy for six weeks to three months and are still having symptoms, then that's probably time to start talking about other things, injections or surgery. But you, a lot of times we can, we can get the athlete or, or the, the patient improve with physical therapy alone. But if, if it's not working after about three months, then it's time to, time to look at some other things. Glenn. I want to go back to your question or your point about the curveball. So I've known him for a long time. He was a part of my fellowship. Uh, he's kind of the, the boss man up in Birmingham. Uh, so I want to talk to your point about the curveball. Okay. You know, there are several schools of thought about throwing the curveball for young pitchers. So what is your opinion about that? Um, so I, I tend to follow the Pitch Smart guidelines. I think it's an excellent organization that is backed by a lot of research. Um, there are definitely studies out there that say curveballs cause injury. There's definitely st studies out there that say curveballs do not cause injury. So you have to kind of take all the literature you have uh, and formula formulate your own opinion. And that's, what, that's why I lean on stuff like PitchSmart. Um, and their recommendation is to, to begin throwing curveballs after you've developed a consistent fastball and change up and usually around age 13 or 14. So that's what I do. Following up on that, wouldn't you say that the studies or study that, that proves that the, uh, it's not a dangerous pitch to curveball is based on lab studies that doesn't reflect fatigue in the real world. Right, right, the exactly. Situation, and so that's kind of the flaw. Of that. that's, the, that's the flaw of that study because it's exactly like you said, the, the athletes aren't fatigued. And I think, like I said earlier, that's the one thing you got to take, take from this. It's not necessarily the curveballs. It's not all that stuff that, the, that are causing these athletes pain and problems and injuries is playing fatigued. So they, they alter their mechanics, they drop their arm, they put more stress on the shoulder and elbow, and that leads to injury, like you said. Yes, ma'am. You said it already, but tell me one more time. Um, how, how many months off in a year should that, three or four months in a row? 
Yeah, so we, we recommend four months off a year, um, and two to three of those months should be consecutive. So they should take three months off in a row, two, at least two months off in a row, and four months off a year. I see you in the back. I'm not ignoring you. Yeah, so I, I, I have children too, and I, the way that I uh, cancel my kids is I want them out there playing. I want them playing as many sports as they can safely. Um, so you need to educate your kids based on this uh, type of information we have, whether it's CTE, whether it's Tommy John's, whether it's shoulder injuries, whether it's you know ACLs, whatever it is, take the information that we have um, and cancel your children that way. So I, I let my kids play sports you just got to make sure you uh, follow the, the guidelines and the recommendations so for baseball which is what we talked about today four months off a year so rest in their elbow rest in their shoulder letting them play football or soccer or cheerleading whatever they want to do you would let your son play football yeah i would i think the the, the values they learn playing a team sport with other kids yeah, over it Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I've read a bunch of the studies too. Um, I think that the team atmosphere and the, the lifelong lessons they, they learn from doing that kind of um, out, outweighs the risk. But that's, that's a decision for everybody to make, you know, just because that's what I think it doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. You well, just and then the younger kids are not generating the same kind of velocity, right? That the other guys exactly. Right. Exactly. <clears throat> Yes, ma'am. The pitch smart, yep, they're on there. Yeah, the pitch smart, it, you know, fatigue would be my number one thing for you to take away from this. Take your athlete out when they're, when they're fatigued. The second thing would be this website. Yeah, so he's at, he's at risk. So other things that they, I think it's on this, the 13 and 14. Yeah, so the other thing is, um, I think it's it, yeah. So avoid playing catcher while not pitching is on there. So if they, you know, if he pitches and he comes out, he shouldn't go to catcher. He, sh he can play something else, but not catcher, because that's the two positions that place the most stress on their, their arm. They're throwing the entire game, so they shouldn't be playing both at the same time. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so Brittany, wherever Brittany is, she might can touch on that. So we're recording it today, and this will go out to Mobile County Public Schools, um, and she can, she can add to that. But, yeah, I'm all about research. That's why I'm here right now. Have you had, what kind of feedback have you had on the point? I haven't had any yet, but I'm open, <laughs> I'm open for it. Yes, ma'am. My grandson's play soccer, and I've been told that a soccer player is more likely to get a concussion than a football player. What, is that, what do you think of Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a concussion e expert. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. But the reason that soccer players are at increased risk is because of headers. And there was talk about, you know, banning headers and, and all that. Um, in the past, but that's, that's why you're at increased risk. It's that, that, that velocity, that head-to-head -head contact that you have in football, whether it be football, soccer, you know, I see it in cheerleaders, everybody. So it's just that you're at increased risk because you're, you're, you know, jumping up and trying to head the ball, and that's, that's how you develop that re repeat trauma. So, yeah, it is a risk in soccer, too. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And dealing with parents and coaches, have you found an effective like communication strategy to say stop when they're tired? Yeah. Because they don't necessarily <laughs> want to hear that. Yeah, no, the athletes don't want to hear that. That's right. why that's why they 
they do what they want to do because they enjoy it. And then the coaches, they want, you know, to succeed and want the athletes to succeed too. It's just all about education. And so I have a lot of printouts that have this stuff that I'll give the athletes. Um, and I, I talk to the athletic trainers and it's just, it's about developing relationships and, 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 tr and trust, honestly. And so that's, you know, it's a work in progress, but that's what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, every athlete's different, and that's true. You know, you've seen some 12-year-olds that look nine and some 12-year-olds that look older than me, you know. So there's, <laughs> there's a wide variety of, of athletes at the age, but, you know, this is the best we have. So this is based on extensive research by Dr. Andrews and, and the Birmingham group, um, and it's been shown that this, it, this is the best recommendation we can, we can have to prevent injury at this age group based on averages. But with that said, I mean, if you're, if you're, you know, 13 year old kid is at pitch 80 and he's starting to hold his arm down or act tired, just cause it says 95 on here, that doesn't mean he's got 15 more pitches. It means he needs to come out of the game. So this is just a guideline, a recommendation. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Have a good weekend.